what do you think happens when you send packets through one of your network interfaces and why do we even have multiple interfaces while at the end of the day we only have one physical network card and wait a minute how does data even go back or route it back to your machine when you send it to local hosts ever heard of network virtualizations this video contains all of this cocoa jumbo nonsense in the simplest funniest way possible assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh i'm mohido and today you are watching probably the coolest networking video ever. Now, before we start diving, we first need to learn how to swim. And by that I mean let's quickly touch on how networking works at a high level. First, blocks of data called frames travel over wires, or air in case of Wi-Fi, to reach your machine. These blocks are often referred to as network frames, but don't get too attached to the name just know that it's data flying through space. Your network card then, or more accurately, the network driver, grabs these frames and passes them to the kernel, the core of your operating system. That's where the magic begins. By the way, if you are curious about drivers and kernel modules, I have another video explaining that or touching that briefly. Go check it out later. Now once the frame hits the kernel, it enters a part of the kernel known as the network stack. The first thing the network stack realm does is it extracts the MAC address from the frame and checks if it's meant to this machine. If it's not, then the frame simply gets deleted. Keep in mind that there is a special MAC address that is meant for all computers, mainly called the broadcast MAC address. Now, if the frame is meant for your computer, the network stack removes the unnecessary parts of the frame, meaning the MAC address and the extra stuff, and sends the leftovers to another part of the network stack. By the way, the leftovers are called packet at this stage, at this moment of time. Now, every packet contains two essential pieces of info. The IP address, which computer is the data for, and the port number, which application on that computer is the data inside the packet, must be delivered to. Last but not least, the stack, the network stack, removes the IP port and other unnecessary, unneeded parts of the packet and just sends or drops the raw data of that packet to the socket file, to the port file. So we end up with raw data in the socket file, where the application is waiting, Think of it as the application constantly watching a box called a socket file, the kernel drops data in that file, the application then sees the data and processes it. So now, just a simple example, if the data is just HTML text, your browser renders it. The app reading the data must be programmed to know what to deal with, what data should be expected inside that socket file. And what about sending data out from the application? The same exact process happens but in reverse. The application writes into the socket file, the kernel gets the data and drops it in a packet and then in a frame. Finally, it sends a frame into the network drivers, which forwards it to the network card and poof. Here it goes to the physical world. Remember that the last piece of the puzzle is the network drivers. So yeah, that's a crash course on how basic networking works today and you truly need to understand this to appreciate the next part the network drivers as we saw earlier network drivers are extra pieces of code that you can add to the kernel's network stack the beauty of the linux ecosystem the beauty of the linux kernel is the ability to extend it with driver modules you want to add an extra feature to any part of the kernel you don't need to edit the kernel code at all you don't even need to touch it you just need to create a kernel plugin, mainly called as a kernel module. And programmers over the past few decades have exploited this beauty in the Linux kernel in very different ways. This flexibility is one of the main reasons why the virtualization software works natively on Linux. I mean, come on, even Docker on Windows requires you to install a Linux kernel on a Linux subsystem. Now back to the network drivers. The convention here in network drivers is almost to do nothing. Literally, they just proxies. They pass frames between the physical network card to the kernel. Nothing extra. And to see what network interfaces drivers are registered. On Linux, you can use the IP address, as you can see. And on Windows, it's the IP config. You see these two network interfaces? They are probably backed by a physical hardware a physical network interface card, while this one, the loopback interface, is an additional virtual network driver that comes with the Linux 
kernel by default. So, what's the difference between a virtual and a physical driver? Well, from the application perspective and from the kernel perspective, of course, they are literally the same thing. The kernel sends data to the driver and the driver sends data back to the kernel. If it's a physical driver, it passes frames to the real network interface card and off to the internet, the frame shall go. And if it's a virtual driver, on the other hand, it can do whatever it wants. Literally, it can do any magic trick. Take the loopback driver, for instance. It's a virtual driver that just sends data back to the kernel. Literally. And the kernel thinks it received something new. Again, this is the beauty of virtualization and the Linux kernel abstractions. Nothing should know how the other thing is implemented. And as far as I know, there is actually no way to tell if these are virtual or physical drivers. Neither the kernel nor the application cares how it works. They just send data and receive data. So beautiful, because now developers can create all kind of funky virtual network drivers. Now it's time to dive deeper. We've done swimming, now let's go diving. So what's a virtualization software? First of all, virtualization is the art of illusion, the art of mimicking the behavior of hardware, but in software. You can virtualize an entire computer, a switch, a network card, even a Game Boy. There are many techniques, but today we are focusing on network and machine virtualization. As always, let's learn by an example. First of all, suppose you create a virtual machine with VirtualBox. It's a famous virtualization tool. First, it allocates disk, RAM, and CPU from the host. This is simply done through talking to the underlying kernel. Remember, virtualization tools are applications. They can request memory, disk, and such from the kernel. Then, you install a full operating system on the allocated resources. This means you're running a new, an entire new kernel on top of the virtualized hardware, of the requested hardware. By the way, I know people are going to roast me down in the comments because I didn't say hypervisor, I said virtualization tool, and to that I say with love tone, go to hell. But seriously, don't go to hell, it's, it's a really bad place. Anyway, the new kernel thinks that the underlying hardware is real. However, the drivers, of course, are specifically made to talk to the virtualization tool instead of the actual hardware devices. But the guest kernel doesn't even know. And honestly, it doesn't even care. Simply, when the guest kernel uses a driver, that driver is secretly talking to the virtualization layer, the hypervisor, which then makes the request actually happen on the host machine. Again, all of this is because of the beauty of abstractions in Linux. The guest kernel gives orders, expects results, and doesn't even care how the results are being done. Okay, this makes sense, but what about networking? At the end of the day, we cannot give real physical network interface cards to every virtual machine, right? So, what do we do? We virtualize the network drivers, and here is the trick. The hypervisor creates a virtual network interface card, a virtual network driver, which looks like the real physical network card interface to the guest operating system, because remember, the kernel doesn't even care if the underlying interface is real or not. Furthermore, it also creates a virtual network interface, another driver, on the host machine. These two talk to each other through the hypervisor, acting as a middleman between the two interfaces. So, when the application on the virtual machine sends a request to the internet or to another application on the same network or to the host, the first thing is that the request or the packet or the data goes through the guest kernel network stack, which does the IP ports procedure, you already know that stuff, and sends the data to the guest virtual network driver, which is the driver that will be talking to the virtualization layer, to the hypervisor. Now, the hypervisor, of course, will receive the information from the kernel, will receive the packet, and then will send the packet back again to the host virtual network driver, which the hypervisor created. The host Interface receives the frame and sends it to the host kernel, network stack, or any other interface. This is mind-blowing, right? Can you imagine that these drivers are scamming the poor kernel? By the way, the special virtual interface created by the hypervisor on the host, remember, the host machine is called tab interfaces. So, the next time you see something like tab0, tab whatever, in the IP address command, you just know that that's a portal between my host kernel and the hypervisor. Now, I think this is one of the most powerful use cases for virtual network drivers, virtual interfaces, but there are still way more use cases. 
From this point forward, I'm calling every interface a network interface rather than a driver or whatever. It will make it simpler because how that is backed by a real hardware or not, it doesn't matter. So to recap, interfaces can be the glue between the internet and your kernel as we saw in the physical network interface card, the network basic interface. And it can also be the glue between your kernel and the virtual machine through the tab interfaces. Also, it can be the glue from your kernel back to itself through the loopback interface. And this is not the end of the list, and it gets even better. One of my favorite tricks about virtual interfaces is the creation of a virtual switch or a router. Basically, you can create a network interface that connects multiple interfaces together like forwarding data between these network interfaces, like how would a real switch do? Linux has a built-in module called Bridge that does exactly that. It behaves just like a switch, gets frame, looks at the MAC address, forwards that to the right interface, and boom, you have a software switch. You can connect it to real network interface cards, virtual machine tabs, containers, whatever. So, you can even create drivers that glue one network interface to another. It's just amazing, wild. People have used these powers to build insane network topologies entirely in software, mainly called the overlay network. An example of this overlay network software that mimics the network behavior literally in software is the open virtual switch and the open virtual network, which literally uses the open virtual switch, but on multi-tenant, multi-host setup. These are literally used everywhere in the cloud, world today, um, AWS, Azure, GCP, they all use these tools under the hood to connect virtual machines and containers to each other over multiple hosts. Want me to make a video about them? Drop a comment down below. And with that said, we are done for today. But wait, I've got an announcement. I've started a Patreon page. If you find this kind of nerdy, fun, joyful content helpful and you want to help us build this channel together, check it out. Also, click here and here, you know, YouTube stuff, that helps a lot. As always, love you all, thank you for watching, and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.